contradictions in the colonial experience. Economic development. In this next part of the lecture, we're going to examine in more detail how Japanese colonial rule was quite contradictory. And we can see that it was contradictory, not only in terms of its economic policies, but also in terms of its assimilation policies. And this, this contradictory nature, this is the source of quite a bit of conflict, not only during the colonial period, but the post-colonial period, because the contradictions often lead to confusion, or differences in opinion. And it is because of this that we see that there are two very different perspectives on the colonial period. And as a result, there is still very little um, agreement on how to evaluate the colonial period if looking at it from the Korean and the Japanese sides. Who benefited the most under colonial economic development? So focusing on economic development during the colonial period, the Japanese wanted to, to develop industry and agricultural production in Korea. So because the southern half of the peninsula has very arable land and is great for rice production, they wanted to increase rice production in the southern part of the Korean peninsula. Also, since Japan didn't produce enough rice to, for their own population, this was one of the attractive features in terms of colonizing Korea. And then for industry, because there are resources, natural resources, in the northern part of the peninsula, and particularly the northeastern coast is close to the Japanese archipelago, the Japanese decided to focus the development of industry in that area. However, when we do look at economic development in Korea, yes, rice production most certainly increased. Yes, most certainly industry and manufacturing were developed. However, this development was quite uneven. It was unanimously unequal, and it was also very one-sided. So we'll take a closer look at how this was the case. For example, the promotion of industry in Korea by the Japanese. In order to do this, the Japanese needed a certain amount of fundamental basic infrastructure. Uh, so because in 1910, uh, Korea was not very developed, the Japanese came in and they started developing railroads, roads, a communication system such as telegraphs and telephones and a banking system. So all of these things that did not exist before the colonial period, the Japanese came in and they developed it. But the reason for its development was because the Japanese needed it. This is what they needed in order to start developing industry and agricultural development in Korea as their colony. If we look at industrialization, this occurred in the 1920s and the 1930s. There are two types of industry. There's light industry and there's heavy industry. Light industrial companies were owned by Koreans and Japanese, but heavy industry was owned by all Japanese companies. And really, the kind of big conglomerates in Japan, the Zaibatsu, that are very recognizable today, such as the Mitsui and Mitsubishi and Toyotas, um, these companies, these conglomerates, were all bolstered by economic development in the colonies and their ability to go to these colonies and have access to these resources. So as you can see, there is 
there are visible signs of the economic development by the Japanese in colonial Korea. If we look at early colonial Korea, the streets are dirt roads, often uneven, narrow, uh, not straight, um, and there are mostly traditional style buildings, and there's very little to no urban planning. This is a picture where we can see one of the large gates through which you would have to enter to get access to Seoul. And uh, for during the Joseon Dynasty, many of these areas were not developed or roads were not developed because Korea is such a mountainous country and it takes a lot of, uh, you have to direct a lot of resources in order to build this infrastructure. However, by the 1930s, we can visibly see a drastic difference in Seoul. So rather than being dominated by dirt roads and unpaved crooked streets and traditional style buildings, now in 1930s Seoul, this looks a little more similar to what we see in Seoul today. There are modern style concrete buildings, there are paved roads, there's an electric streetcar, which was actually invented before the colonial period, but becomes uh, more widely used during the colonial period. Uh, and then there's also electricity and running water and other modern facilities and conveniences. So physically we can see the difference in, in the development and modernization, at least in the capital. And by 1941 we see that Seoul is really quite a metropolis and thoroughly modernized. You can see the power lines and the electricity. Uh, the people are wearing modern style clothing. The students are in their school uniforms. Um, and there is this thorough blending as well uh, between the Koreans and the Japanese. You can see uh, this one person wearing a Japanese kimono. And, and so there is this, this thorough blending. Keijo is the, was the Japanese name for Seoul during the colonial period. However, there were limitations to the development that occurred during the colonial period. And this is where that contradictory nature uh, is exposed. So, for example, as I mentioned, the Japanese needed to build uh, transportation in order to develop the economy. And so they started to build railroads. However, the railroads, uh, they connected the major ports that Japan had access to. So Busan, Incheon, Wonsan, um, and they connected uh, the major cities, again, that Japan was developing, such as Busan and Seoul and Pyongyang. Um, but as you can see, the railroads run in a north-south direction. This is because that was what was most convenient and most advantageous to the Japanese. Would it have been nice to have east-west running lines? Of course. But this is not what the Japanese needed, and so they didn't build it. And so this is what I mean by limitations to economic development. Also, up in the northeastern region, uh, where Wonsan, the port of Wonsan is, this is where industrial development was concentrated. And again, this location was chosen because of its proximity to Japan. So as we go in further into the colonial period, we see that as Japan expands their empire and acquires more territories, and particularly after they set up the puppet state of Manchukuo in Manchuria, Korea occupies a central and strategic position 
in the Japanese Empire and in the Japanese imperial economy. So being uh, centrally located uh, and all of the other territories kind of surrounding it, Korea becomes fully integrated into the Japanese imperial economy. And at one point later on in the period, it becomes very difficult to separate out the Korean economy from the Japanese imperial economy because it is in fact all one economy. In terms of rural development, so in order to develop agricultural production, the Japanese had to conduct a land survey. And this they did between 1910 and 1918. During this, this survey, owners to the land had to prove title. They had to prove that they had claim, rightful claim to the land. And if you were a wealthy landowner, an aristocrat, your land had been given to you, bestowed upon you um, by the government many decades or centuries ago, this is not a problem. You have documentation for this. But let's say you are a peasant farmer and you just have kind of a verbal agreement with the landowner and this verbal agreement has been in place for generations and it's just that the aristocratic family knows that your peasant family is able to farm this plot of land. Well, you don't have any documentation to produce to the Japanese and so the Japanese then confiscate that land. In addition, the royal household in Korea, they owned a vast amount of land. And by the time the Japanese started conducting this land survey, they dissolved the, ja the Korean monarchy, started intermarrying the Korean royal family with the Japanese imperial family. And so they also seized that land. So by the end of the land survey, we, we find that the Japanese end up becoming the largest landowner in Korea. As mentioned, though, as the agricultural production increases and is modernized, we see, on the other hand, the feudal landlord tenant system maintained. And so let's say now that there are several peasant families that have uh, traditionally had the right to, to farm land on this aristocrat's large piece of land and they are kicked off or they are unable to prove, t prove claim to this land. So now the wealthy landlord can claim that land and say that it's his. And so, and so for, for many wealthy landlords, uh, they were able to expand their land ownings, whereas for the pe peasants, the de their deterioration further increases. So during the Joseon dynasty, there's this disparity between landlords and peasant farmers or tenant farmers, and this disparity only increases during the colonial period. So, in the 1910s and the 1920s, Korean rice production increases and is exported to Japan. In fact, Koreans didn't really eat white rice during the colonial period because it was all being exported to Japan. The problem came in 1929 with the Great Depression and the collapse of the international market. So uh, if you were a farmer and you are unable to pay rent or to um, uh, you have a bad harvest year, then you have to take out a loan in order to pay and to survive. And so this is what we see increasingly happening in the 1910s and the 1920s. But with the collapse of the international rice market, many of these peasants were unable to pay back their loans and were forced into poverty. And so while we have uh, an already worsening disparity between landlords and tenant farmers, the Great Depression and collapse of the rice market 
further exacerbates this disparity. So now we have class divisions that are even wider than before. One also contradictory aspect of the Japanese colonial period was that as Japan is justifying its colonization of Korea by saying that they have come in to modernize the country, they still preserve traditional values such as Confucian ideology. And they preserve Confucian ideology and values because this benefits the Japanese empire. According to Confucian ideology, one must be loyal to their ruler. So instead of being loyal to the Korean king, now that loyalty is to be transferred to the Japanese emperor. And because the Japanese emperor is divine, Koreans can show their loyalty to the emperor by participating in Shinto worship. This kind of ideological control increases during the wartime years. So as Japan enters into World War II, and as they feel the need to mobilize all of their resources for the wartime effort, we see the increase in the, the tightening of ideological control. This is because Japan needs wartime unity. They need all of its subjects, all of its imperial subjects, regardless of whether they're in Japan, Korea, Taiwan, they need them all to be unified. So we have some forced assimilation policies that begin to be implemented from 1937 until the end of the period. For example, there was the name order. This is a very infamous uh, policy that the Japanese instituted. Uh, they said that Koreans had to change their Korean names to Japanese names. This was also a time when Koreans were no longer allowed to speak Korean and they had to all speak Japanese. Well, from the Japanese perspective, this makes sense because if you are now recruiting Koreans to be Japanese imperial soldiers, as you give commands out on the battlefield, you need all of your soldiers to understand what those commands are. Otherwise, a mistake could be fatal. Uh, from the Korean perspective, this was Japan trying to erase their culture. These are the keywords for this class. Land Survey Landlord Tenant Great Depression